From CVP here in Cincinnati, Ohio, it's the Doc to Doc podcast. Short videos to keep you up to date and connected to CVP physicians across the country. I'm Dr. Lori Proventure. Today I'm excited to have Dr. Basil Williams with me. He's a CEI retina doctor and an ocular oncologist. He's director of the University of Cincinnati Ocular Oncology Department and he's co-director of the retinoblastoma program at Ch Cincinnati Children's. Today our conversation is going to center around new approaches you're taking to patients with choroidal melanoma who are treated with brachytherapy and ways to prevent radiation retinopathy and neovascular glaucoma. So depending on what study you read and the tumor characteristics, radiation ret retinopathy can occur in about 50% of patients up to two years after therapy. So essentially you're seeing this all the time in your clinic, so it's no surprise that you are very passionate about this topic. It's something that we see quite commonly and it's one of the things that we warn patients about from the very beginning. It's one of the possible side effects of radiation. Uh, we kind of explain that radiation does a great job at killing the tumor, but it's not particularly smart. It affects everything in its path and so it kills the tumor, but it also affects a lot of the healthy tissues around and therefore you get some of the side effects. What measures are you taking at the time of plaque placement to minimize radiation retinopathy? So there's a few factors that we think about from the very beginning to try and reduce the development of radiation retinopathy and to think about neovascular glaucoma. So we know that tumors that have a larger size and that are more posterior uh, require more radiation and get more radiation to the vital structures of the eye, including the optic nerve and the fovea. And so uh, we are giving intraoperative subtenon steroids to try and reduce the inflammation that happens as a result of the radiation treatment. This is particularly important in larger tumors because more radiation is used and as the radiation affects the tumor, it causes the cells to lyse and release a lot of inflammation. Mm -hmm. So we usually use a small amount of steroids, maybe about 10 milligrams or so uh, of triamcinolone for smaller tumors, but if the tumors get very large, over 14 or 15 millimeters in diameter, over six or seven millimeters in thickness, we use a full uh, 40 milligrams of triamcinolone in those situations. Are you doing any sort of prophylactic laser, um, anticipating things like radiation retinopathy? That's another really good point. So uh, the radiation kills the tumor and some of the vital structures of the retina around it, and therefore that leads to ischemic retina. And this process can be very similar to diabetic retinopathy, where it affects the blood vessels, makes them a little bit more permeable, and makes the retina more ischemic, therefore leading to inflammatory markers or VEGF being released. Mm -hmm. So we feel that at the time of treatment, if you can actually put laser in the area of the treatment window for radiation, that will reduce this ischemic drive and reduce the inflammation that happens afterwards. So in all patients who have a flat retina around the tumor at the time of uh, plaque placement, we try and put our laser in at that time. In line with what we do for diabetics, you mentioned uh, laser to the ischemic retina. What about anti-VEGF? Are you using that prophylactically? Yeah, so this is one of the more interesting things that have de that's developed in uh, ocular oncology as of late. We see that a large percentage of patients develop radiation retinopathy and one of the ways you can try and prevent or at least delay that is by giving intravitreal injections of anti-VEGF medication. And so doing that on a somewhat regular basis for the first couple of years seems to significantly delay uh, the disease uh, development. And so there are a few places across the country doing this and there's a range from doing the injections every six weeks to doing them every four months. According to the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, they're recommending that we see patients maybe every three months for the first year or so. And based on that time frame, I'm giving injections every three months, usually for the first two years, to minimize development of radiation retinopathy. And so far, it's doing pretty well. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing a difference if you do the injections, at the incidence of, compared to patients that don't get any injections once you stop injections? Yeah, so what we've done is we've uh, compared historical data uh, of people who have not had uh, anti-VEGF injections at the time of plaque placement, as in they only got injections after actually developing radiation retinopathy. And by the two-year mark, the visual acuity is better and there's a lower percentage of people uh, who have developed radiation retinopathy by that time. Now, 
it's probably best thinking about injection burden and the challenge that brings for patients to target people who are most likely to get radiation retinopathy. Mm -hmm. So we're often not doing this for people with iris tumors or ciliary body only tumors, mm -hmm. but for choroidal melanomas and more posterior ones, then we do do this. Uh, in terms of when we stop at the two year mark, it does seem that there's less of those patients that develop radiation retinopathy than if they were never treated, but the number of people that develop radiation retinopathy definitely increases. Mm -hmm. It's just really hard to convince people to continue going with periodic injections for prophylaxis, especially when we're not required to see them that often for disease management. So as a glaucoma specialist, I'm very curious, you mentioned NVG. What's the primary driver for the development of anterior segment neovascularization and then therefore NVG? Is it ischemia? Is it anterior segment ischemia or posterior segment anti-VEGF mediated? I think there's a combination of factors and truthfully we don't fully understand the mechanism yet. And I would say that because it's something that's uh, rare in terms of the number of patients that have melanomas, um, we haven't pooled the data across the country and across the world well enough to tell the individual mechanisms. We have done some biopsies, um, some AC taps on people, um, and it shows that the VEGF levels are extremely high, but there's a wide number of inflammatory markers that seem to contribute to the development of neovascularization. It's hard to say whether removal of a muscle leads to ischemia as well. If you need to remove more than one muscle, that indicates a very, very large tumor. And so those people are at risk of having radiation retinopathy and neovascular glaucoma because the tumor is larger and there's more radiation. And so it's hard to separate out how much the muscles affect things. Um, but we do think the larger the tumor, the more radiation is required, the more ischemic the retina is going to be, and therefore the more anti-VEGF is going to kick in. Additionally, we do see that there's something called tumor lipid exudation syndrome. And that's basically where the radiation does a good job at killing the tumor, but then afterwards the tumor continues to release these inflammatory markers and has its own drive towards neovascularization even after the treatment is done and after the tumor is theoretically dead. Mm -hmm. What are you doing in particular for those patients? Yeah, those can be a little bit of a challenge. So, uh, historically, we've tried to treat those patients with intravitreal or periocular steroids and intravitreal anti-VEGF medications, and I think that's most commonly what's done these days. Uh, I think even in those patients, however, you end up with almost 30% of people who develop neovascular glaucoma resulting in a nucleation. And that can be a little bit of a challenge for a person who has had a tumor that has been well treated, but to suffer a nucleation from some of the complications. And so we are now uh, utilizing endoresection after radiation treatment has been done, where basically we perform a vitrectomy, uh, and after the vitreous has been removed, we will cut an area of the retina and flap the retina over, and then we'll eat the entirety of the tumor put laser in the area of the tumor, and then put the retina back in place, add laser, and leave silicone oil in the eye. Um, and this seems to reduce the development of neovascular glaucoma pretty significantly, um, although it hasn't necessarily shown better visual outcomes in the long run. The benefit largely is in preventing neovascular glaucoma and then ultimately preventing a nucleation Keeping as a result. Eye. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's great. That's really interesting. I think a lot of us here, when, you know, when you talk about operating on an eye that has a tumor, we, we get nervous. You know, we remember our retinoblastoma training, which you're familiar with. Are there any concerns about spread of a tumor after it's undergone brachytherapy? So I think it depends, obviously, on the type of tumor you're talking about. Retinoblastoma is very concerning for extraocular spread. It tends to be a very aggressive disease. Melanoma tends not to be as aggressive. Um, that being said, we definitely recommend brachytherapy first. So uh, I don't do uh, endoresection without prior radiation treatment. In addition to that, I'd like to wait at least three to six months so I can see the response in the tumor from the radiation mm -hmm. to make sure that there's been a good response. And then after that, there's some methods that I do to try and reduce the risk of extraocular extension even though the tumor cells are theoretically dead. So if I'm doing a vitrectomy, I'll make a pyridomy first 
to make sure that if any seeds actually come out of the eye, they're not trapped underneath the conjunctiva, that they're exposed on the sclera immediately. When we remove the trocars at the end of the case, we'll put immediately a triple freeze thaw cryotherapy there to kill the cells. And then we always suture every sclerotomy so that there is no possibility of cells egressing from the eye within the first day or first couple of days of, post -oper of the post-operative period. So um, it's something that we are aware of, uh, even though it tends not to be so high risk, especially with using small gauge vitrectomy. Great. So what should um, CVP physicians know when they're, they're seeing a tumor that they think might qualify for brachytherapy and they're referring to you? Or do you have any recommendations for us when you know, the patient is inevitably going to have questions right away? Yeah, so it can be really difficult to manage uh, the expectations and emotions and the anxiety that a patient has when they're initially diagnosed with a tumor. When it's a very, very large tumor and it's very clear that it's a melanoma, you can easily have the conversation or at least state, well, there seems to be a tumor in your eye, it seems to be a melanoma, and we're going to send you in the right place to get treatment. Some of the challenges are patients immediately go to Google, and our historical data shows that there can be up to a 50% death rate. And so patients read that information and get extremely anxious. As we've done more, as we've done more research lately, we realize the death rate is lower, the metastasis rate tends to be lower, and a lot of that is based on the genetic information of the tumor. And so I think one of the best ways to prep patients for this is to say, you know, this seems to be a melanoma, but we're not going to know how aggressive it is until after we get some more of the genetic information in regards to the tumor, and that'll let us know what kind of risk uh, you have in the future. And that way they can understand, okay, I know what's going on, but this doesn't mean that it's going to spread and it doesn't mean that it's a death sentence and it's something that they, it can ease their anxiety um, until they get in to see me and we can talk more about things in detail. Exactly. It's an intricate balance telling them enough to make sure they come to you, but also not telling them too much and leaving it up to experts like you. It is a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. Dr. Williams, thank you so much for coming today. We're so lucky to have you at CVP and thank you for joining us for this podcast. And we look forward to sharing patients with you and working with you and, and doing the best we can to take good care of patients. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here.